Calaroga Shark Media. Rob Schneider, man, what are you doing? Hi, I'm Johnny Mag with your Daily Comedy News. Uh, basketball player Dikembe Mutombo passed away on Monday from brain cancer at age 58. Mutombo, 7 feet 2, was born in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Back in 1998, he raised money to build a 300-bed hospital in his native Congo. During the COVID pandemic, he became a public advocate. In December of 21, Dikembe posted a video on Twitter urging people to get vaccinated against COVID. In that tweet, he wrote, This holiday season, stay informed from trusted sources like the World Health Organization and get vaccinated only together. Can we be safe and defeat COVID? Dikembe passed away on Monday. Rob Schneider retweeted the COVID tweet and wrote, Rest in peace. I'm sure this is just another coincidence, but I took a pass on the jab and I'm not going to let anyone I know and who will listen get it either. You know, Rob, there's a time to get your message across and there's a time to just not be a jerk and pick your spots, dude. The LA Times wrote a big profile of Tom Segura and Christina Pazitsky's podcast Empire. Tom said the Joe Rogan experience paved the way. I thought Joe was insane when he started JRE. I thought it was some rich guy thing where he's talking in a room in his house and had some message board. A few months later, after seeing Christina do stand-up, he was like, you two should do a podcast together. Brian Redband recalls, when we started at JRE in 2009, it was Rogan promoting his shows and giving him an outlet to talk. Then it just blew up overnight. Something clicked and I was like, what's going on with Joe is helping him so much. I want to make podcasts for all my friends. It was so new. I definitely had to do some convincing. Christina was like, what the F is a podcast? It sounded like building a space shuttle back then. They finally got on board. Red Band convinced them and they started Your Mom's House. Christina said, we'd go to Burbank in the summer and sit on this gross leather couch. All he had was a wall unit air conditioner and would have to turn it off to tapes. So we'd just be sitting there sweating. Eventually, they moved the podcast to their own home in Silver Lake. Segura said, we did about 40 episodes with Red Band and then I took it over and had a huge tech error, making it unlistenable. Christina says, to my brilliant husband's credit, there was no podcasting. This was a technological medium that was essentially invented as we went along. We lived in a crummy two-bedroom apartment. We were newlyweds and we had no money. We got a mixing board, two mics, and a computer. At that point, we slept in one room and used the other room as an office. It bordered this other house where this lady would cook the smelliest food and have aggressive sex. Tom said, oh yeah, she was newly divorced and very performative with um, uh, her cheering. I love cleaning things up. It's more fun. I, I teach this to the college kids. I could have just said the O word there. It's not particularly naughty. But when I clean things up, I think it makes it more fun. Tom said in the early days, it was like, I think we can probably get to the point where this podcast pays our rent. It was such an exciting thing because we'd go into the room and talk for an hour. And it actually did pay our rent from there. It just kept growing, which is a good time for me to say, I want to thank you for listening. The numbers September was really strong uh, and the ad sales are good. And we're into the fourth quarter now, which is when podcasts really make their money. You always make the most money in the fourth quarter. So I'm a little excited and quite thankful. Thank you for listening every day. John Oliver is upset with the bosses over at Max. John Oliver was on the interview podcast with the New York Times. The topic... HBO announcing they're holding back segments from uh, last week tonight for a few days from YouTube after they premiere. Previously, you were able to watch the show's main story on YouTube the morning after an episode aired. Oliver said, it's massively frustrating to me. I was not happy with it at all. What I love about having the show on YouTube is that we can reach beyond HBO subscribers. That feels really important to me. I really, really appreciate the fact that they do that. I would rather they did it straight after the show the way we've always done it, but I'm very grateful that they're willing to still do it at all. So, John, I don't know if you know this. The reason HBO pays you and other creators is to get consumers to give HBO money to see the programming that's behind the paywall. That's how this all works. If they were to put Last Week Tonight up on YouTube, there's really no reason to pay you. I don't know if you understand that part of the business. I get the sentiment that you want people to see it, but that's not how this works. A spokesperson told The Hollywood Reporter a few months ago, when Last Week Tonight with John Oliver premiered on HBO, the convenience of watching on Max did not exist. So YouTube allowed flexible viewing for the main story as well as promotional exposure. We're now delaying that availability and hope those fans choose to watch the entire show on Max. When this was announced in February, Oliver tweeted, I know I usually share a link to our main story here on Mondays, but HBO has decided they're going to wait until Thursday to post them to YouTube from now on. I hope they change their mind. But until then, you can see our piece about the Supreme Court on HBO, on Max, and on YouTube in a few days. 
John is currently signed through 2026 and said, I worked with John Stewart for a long time. I saw him get exhausted, so I know what that looks like. I saw him reckoning with, I've done this every possible way that I can do it. And he was right about that. Like, you can't really do it any better. I've not hit that point yet. I still absolutely love making the show. I get excited, like to your point of bouncing up and down the chairs when we feel like we're onto something with a story or if we worked out something really dumb to do. It's so fun. I can't believe that we get to ram stories down people's throats that they might not naturally want to hear and then watch it. And I can't believe that we get to play with HBO's resources. Yeah, you get to play with HBO's resources. And that's why your show's behind the paywall. And do dumb things on fiscally irresponsible scale. So I guess my answer to that point might come. I don't feel like I'm there yet. I was just thinking about Jon Stewart. I started to listen to his interview on Conan. I feel like uh, the return of Jon, that Jon is somehow less endearing. His first Daily Show run, he felt like uh, the cuddly rascal. And this time, he just feels like older, more establishment John Stewart? I don't know. It's not as warm and fuzzy this time around. I can't quite put my finger on it. I, I really feel bad for Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, Jimmy doesn't quite realize that Jimmy Kimmel Live is going to be canceled. Johnny Mac, why? Why are they canceling Jimmy Kimmel Live? Well, here's why. They added Andy Richter to the show. <laughs> Andy Richter is the modern day Ted McGinley. Andy has taken out Conan three times by himself. Andy Richter had sitcoms. Andy Richter appears on your show. I will never have him on the show because this show will get canceled and I own the show. I would have to self cancel. Anyway, Andy Richter is now playing Tim Walls on Jimmy Kimmel Live, which makes me think in about nine months, I'll be telling you that the Jimmy Kimmel Live show is ending. You can bookmark this. Cracked caught up with the guy that started the backlash against Ellen. Remember all that? They remind us the Ellen backlash came from a 2020 tweet posted by comedian Kevin T. Porter. The tweet appears in Ellen's recent special, although his name is blacked out. Back in 21, Porter told Metro he wasn't trying to damage the notoriously mean talk show host. He was merely trying to find a funny way to do something positive in the early days of the pandemic explained in 21 we're about two weeks into the lockdown a lot of my friends were doing kind of interesting creative things to raise money for different charities so my version of that was to do the thread on twitter because i thought it would be funny porter initially assumed he would receive only super niche replies from the la comedy scene but the thread went viral porter pointed out the consistency of the stories being posted made the claims hard to dismiss the Gilbert Gottfried estate has revealed the title and release date for his posthumous comedy album still screaming Still Screaming will be out November 15th. The album is a curated compilation of some of Gilbert's greatest bits and impressions, delivering as only he could. Some of the material comes from the 2017 documentary Gilbert. The album will be released on a limited edition vinyl, featuring rare photos of Gilbert with family and friends, a heartfelt and funny historical account of Gilbert from longtime friend Penn Gillette, and a vinyl side etched with Gilbert's own original artwork. Hulu continues to be hilarious. <laughs> They've announced another comedy special. This one, it's Chris Stefano, which is being executive produced by Jimmy Kimmel, who doesn't yet realize that his show's about to be canceled. The special is called It's Just Unfortunate. Hilarious kicks off in November with Jim Gaffigan. Hulu's head of scripted content, Jordan Hellman, told The Hollywood Reporter, the mantra is very much quality over quantity. Stefano will be out in 25, no date yet. The other hilarious comedians, a pretty good run here. Bill Burr, Alana Glazer, Roy Wood Jr., Otsko Atkatska, Jessica Kirsten, Jim Gaffigan, and Sebastian Maniscalco. Fun note here, in 2023, Stefano became the first stand-up comedian to sell out both Radio City Music Hall and the theater at Madison Square Garden, which is not uh, the garden, that's the theater at Madison Square Garden, on consecutive nights. I don't know if you know this, but uh, Saturday Night Live is turning 50. Well, we're going to talk about it every day for the next nine months. Spirit Halloween, not happy with Saturday Night Live. I don't know if you watched the episode. There was a very, very funny sketch that destroyed Spirit Halloween. But as I was watching it, I'm like, this is a great advertisement for Spirit. But the uh, folks at Spirit apparently don't understand the value of getting people talking about you. They tweeted... Alongside a photo of a fake SNL costume, we are great at raising things back from the dead. Ooh, zing. The costume was labeled Irrelevant 50-Year-Old TV Show. The packaging said it included dated references, unknown cast members, and shrinking ratings. Zing. In case you missed it, uh, the gist of the sketch was how Spirit Halloween is helping the economy by opening stores for six weeks and then disappearing into the night and made fun of the knockoff costumes. For example, a young girl wanted a Taylor Swift costume and Chloe Fineman gives her blonde singing woman. 
The girl points out the costume isn't Taylor Swift, and Chloe says, and neither are you. <laughs> the punchline, Spirit Halloween, when you need us, we'll be here for six weeks, because on November 1st, we're gone, and all this junk will be in the dumpster. Laugh it up, Spirit, it's good stuff. People like the episode. It got 5.3 million viewers. That's the best start for a season since 2020, and up 15% over last year's 4.6 million for episode one. Seth Myers and his grip Kenny have a bet about an upcoming Jets Steelers game. If the Jets win, Seth Myers, who's a Steelers fan, will be forced to place a mug with the score on his TV desk throughout the end of the football season. If the Steelers win, Kenny will get a tattoo with the final score and Myers' signature on his wrist. Ugh. I mean, the Jets aren't going to win, but don't even take that bet. That I mean, it's so lopsided. Myers told his viewers, Kenny set the terms. Kenny said, I want to change the terms. If you win, I get two tattoos. Wow. Ahmed Ahmed was at the Palm Springs International Comedy Festival Awards, and then suddenly event president Paul Cruz presented him with a special award. Ahmed said, with the name Ahmed Ahmed, I can't even fly a kite in this country. I've only won one other award in my life. It was the Richard Pryor Award for Ethnic Comedy at the Edinburgh Comedy Festival of 2004, and that was the first and last time they ever gave it out. And let's take a quick overview of the finalists of the 2024 Comedy Wildlife Awards. These include an otter guru and a squirrel stuck headfirst in a tree. The Comedy Wildlife team has narrowed down nearly 9,000 submissions to 40 standalone photos, four portfolio entries, and three videos. Some of the finalists include a smiling elephant seal, an otter holding its feet up in the pose of a guru, a contemplative chimpanzee, a cheetah playing hide-and-seek, and the squirrel stuck headfirst in a tree. Other images capture a raccoon appearing to whisper in a fellow raccoon's ear, a fish chasing an eagle across the sky, and a frog whose head is enveloped by a large bubble in the water. You can go to the competition's website through October 31st. The winner will receive a cash prize of about $670, depending on the exchange rates of the British pounds on that particular day. All winners of the competition will be announced at an award ceremony in London on December 10th. And that's your comedy news for today. If you enjoy the program, tell a friend about it. They might like it too. I guess some of you are doing this. this the numbers are up. Thank you very much. Uh, if you like the show without ads, just like the show notes. Tell you about that, and I'll see you tomorrow.